cloud. Great. We're recording and we should be live. And I will continue to welcome and introduce people as you, as you arrive. Here we go. We're live. And if you see me looking down to my left, excuse me, I'm trying to field the questions and see who's online on Facebook as well. Um, but meanwhile, it's 9.02 here in Israel. We change our clocks tonight. So we will go back to the previously scheduled time difference that most of you are familiar with. And um, right now I just wanna get started. I'm, I'm so excited because first of all, it's wonderful that everyone's joining us here with this program today. Um, it's the beginning of the Genesis 123 Foundation's Global Passover Prayer for Israel, uh, which is obviously around the, uh, the Passover festival that we are uh, about to begin celebrating uh, this weekend. And, and it's a, and it's, and as a standalone program, I'm really excited about it. As I was thinking through what we're going to talk about or try and talk about and get through, and some of the questions and feedback we're already getting from you, the participants, um, I'm really excited to see where this is, uh, where this is going to go. Um, but I realize, and, and uh, uh, for instance, Rabbi Wilicki just had the opportunity to introduce me to somebody who I've not yet met. Um, many of you or some of you don't know me. So let me just give you a word about myself and, and why we're here. Uh, I'm Jonathan Feldstein. I have the real privilege and honor to be the president of the Genesis 123 Foundation. Some of our board members, advisory board members, and other friends are, are, are watching right now. And welcome to everybody. Sorry if I don't rec uh, recognize everybody here as I moderate and, and engage myself in the conversation, but I hope you, you find this meaningful. Uh, the Genesis 123 Foundation is a nonprofit based in America that's just about three years old. And our mission is wonderful. It's exciting. It's very simple to build bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel in ways that are new and unique and meaningful. And I'm not going to go through all of the programs that we've launched and were paused by the pandemic and that we will yet relaunch. Um, but this, this program as part of the Global Prayer for Israel is a spinoff of our ongoing inspiration from Zion uh, program is one of those programs that is indeed unique and meaningful and, uh, and new. And so we're excited that you're all here to join us. I certainly invite you all to be in touch with me individually um, as, you, as you can for more information um, or, or visit the website, genesis123.co. Um, just technically before I introduce our, our wonderful guests today, um, I, I'd like to ask everybody, if you're not muted, it's hard for me to pay attention to that. Please keep your microphones muted. And as long as you're not doing anything that might be a distraction to any of the participants, um, then by all means, keep your videos on so we feel like you're here physically with us. Um, but if, that, if there's an issue or there's some background, um, we'd love it if you would just kind of shut the camera off for whatever um, duration is necessary. Um, definitely, by all means, share this, especially if you're watching. Now I see my friend Tisha is also watching from Virginia um, on YouTube. So definitely, please, please share this uh, today. And it will also continue to be housed on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Now, one of the reasons I'm really excited about uh, the program today is that it's entirely unrehearsed, unscripted, and we have kind of a roadmap, or at least I do, about where I want to take the conversation, but I think we may entirely go off script um, any number of occasions as well to the extent that there is or will be a script. Um, what this is meant to be is a dialogue between two wonderful, knowledgeable, personable rabbis who are both in their own right, great teachers and communicators. And we were just speaking before, the, before uh, everyone started joining us. It's not meant to be a debate, but in the finest of Jewish traditions, some wonderful in-depth conversations can easily become a debate. So we'll just see where it goes. Uh, and I'm excited about that. Um, but the purpose now tonight, it, I'm, I'm always saying tonight because it's nighttime here. Um, the purpose is to explore Passover, mostly for our Christian friends who are following. I think most people who are, are Christian uh, and joining us from the prism of our uh, Jewish experience. Um, we will definitely be opening it up to your questions. I encourage people. Uh, oh, Dave Garmus wants to know who, if, if I know who will be prime minister. No, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, but that's not relevant to Pesach. 
to pass over specifically. But definitely, if you have questions, um, please post them in the chat here on Zoom if you're following on Zoom. Or I see there are a number of people watching on Facebook already, and that's great. And I'm going to do my best to uh, field those questions at the end of the conversation. We'll try and do a more formal Q and A. Um, and because this is this is one of four programs as part of the Global Passover Prayer for Israel. Uh, well, I'm also thrilled that the last of them next week on April 1st will be a, um, a, a program with a, pa a panel of four Christians who uniquely celebrate Passover on their own as kind of the bookend of, of the two sides of the program. So, uh, so definitely, I don't have a slides or, or, or sign up details. I know I should, I was a little uh, sloppy today, um, but for information about our other programs, that are coming up next week, please, please, please be in touch. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook um, because we've got some really, really exciting uh, programs coming up. Now, uh, to quickly introduce our, our guests and to kind of get into that dialogue, um, we have with us Rabbi Avi Baumel and Rabbi Pesach Wilicki, who, as I said, are both knowledgeable, thoughtful teachers, lecturers, and friends. Um, and, I, and I'm really privileged to have them here on all those accounts. Um, Rabbi Baumel, um, who's in the blue Wabi wave, okay, um, serves as the Ju uh, Jewish community leader of Krakow, Poland. Um, and although he's my next door neighbor here in Efrat, he commutes back and forth when we don't have a pandemic and is a central part of the life cycle event and the revival of the Jewish community in Krakow, uh, Poland, um, as well as dealing with the scars of the past in the wake and shadow and the, of the destruction of the Holocaust and the Jewish communities that were decimated there. Um, he engages Christians uh, widely in Poland. He learned Polish in order to do so, which um, impresses me. Uh, I'm impressed and, uh, and, and, and lectures in Polish and in English and, and is... Um, Wait, I, I thought this was in Polish, this, this uh, webinar. This... Oh, I'm trying to think I can only say thank you in Polish. <laughs> I'll save that for the end. Uh, you can try out your Polish if you want. Um, and uh, he engages Christians widely there in Poland, which is really wonderful. Um, has a long his, uh, history as a communal rabbi and, 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 and educated um, with, with lots of degrees that we're not gonna go into, but is what, it's wonderful to have uh, Rabbi Baumol aboard with us. Rabbi Pesach Wilicki and I have overlapped and interacted and become close friends um, over the over a number of years. Um, he's worked with a wide range of Jewish and Christian organizations, built, also building bridges through his unique ability to emphasize the common denominators of God and Israel, the Torah, and of course the state of Israel and the significance of that to us as Jews and Christians. He lectures frequently at churches, Christian colleges and seminaries. Um, he's written and published articles appearing in the Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, and Charisma. And, um, and I'm excited to give a little teaser for the fact that he's working on a really exciting book project that, that, that uh, is in tandem with a project that we have uh, called Verses for Zion to teach uh, Christian children about um, the significance of Israel through studying verses, biblical verses relating to Israel. So we'll look forward to sharing more about that when we're ready. But that's been a long introduction. Let's jump into some of the questions. I think what we're gonna do tonight, folks, is kind of go back and forth and, and uh, I'll pose the question, comment and have one of our uh, esteemed rabbis respond and then, and, and then the other can add or comment or, or debate if we get into that. Um, I'd just like so, to say, uh, yeah. in, by way of introduction, that uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to a discussion, a dialogue. I'm a little nervous about a debate. I'll tell you why. I found myself at a distinct disadvantage here because Rabbi Pesach Wilicki, his name actually means Passover. Yeah. So you have a guy you're debating and he, about Passover and his name is Passover. Right. All I'm God is an Abraham. And yeah. that's a hard one to. to that's right, to Rabbi. Up. It's over before it started. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, well, let's give it a shot since you're both here anyway. And with that, how about we ask the first question to Rabbi Baumol. Um, something personal and really very important as it relates to Judaism and, and, and everything we do. Food. During Passover, 
there are certain kinds of food we don't eat. Chametz is the Hebrew, any form of leaven product from, from grains. Um, and, and that is all kinds of baked food and prepared foods and even uh, alcohol and what have you. Relating to you in your life, and, and this allows you to kind of go back a little bit, what, um, what are your favorite Passover foods? And where, when, where do those traditions come from? What, are the, what, are the food, what does food hearken to you? Well, you know, you certainly know how to start when you go straight to my, uh, my stomach and uh, my, the fond memories that I have. And Jews, you know, we get together. We get together to uh, pray. We get together to uh, celebrate. And usually both of those occur with an eating before or after or during. So there's a lot of food uh, elements related to, uh, to our Jewish experience and our calendar. And uh, Pesach might be the most prominent one uh, where the foods are not just um, an addition to uh, an ancillary to part of the program, but here the food is an essential component to how we tell the story. In fact, a great rabbi thousands of years ago, Rabbi Gamliel, and we recite him at the, in the evening, he said, if you don't point to various foods and talk about them and let them integrate into your Pesach experience, you are not fulfilling this great mitzvah, this great uh, uh, commandment to tell this story properly. So if in the story of Passover thousands of years ago, the, the Israelites started their process, started the whole story with food, with a meal, with a Korban Pesach, with the, with the Passover sacrifice, with the Paschal lamb. That's how the whole story began. And that is in, you know, in temple times, the essential, the, the, I, the, the most important component of the uh, experience. And afterwards, then there's the matzah that's, uh, that's uh, representing many different things. It's obviously vital for generations for us to, to uh, connect to the foods and the, the way that the, uh, the foods are presented and, and how we talk about them and what they mean to us. You know, I'd love to say that um, matzah is my favorite, but uh, I'll eat a bagel any day of the week. <laughs> um, and uh, matzah, on the other hand, is very hard. It's a very difficult food to consume. And we have to ask ourselves, and we do around the Seder table, why? Why are we forced to eat this? And we're supposed to eat this matzah and at the same time try to express a redemptive experience. So we, ha we have uh, like different dichotomous uh, uh, definitions or uh, expressions of, of a matzah and, uh, and, and we go around the table and everyone tries to give their interpretation. Sometimes it's more subjective and sometimes it's more standard, but we're trying to apply the messages of thousands of years ago to our lives today. So for me, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special holiday with special types of foods but not necessarily the ones that uh, uh, are about, you know, how, how tasty they are, but more, more about how meaningful they are. Lovely. That's nice. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Willicky, what are you, what about you? Pesach? Uh, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to accidentally keep doing that I'm, uh, by mixing up folks. If I call him Pesach, I don't mean to be calling him Pesach. I'm calling him Rabbi Willicky, but I'm referring to the holiday Pesach, which is Passover. So, okay. Rabbi okay. Willicky, what about the Passover foods? <laughs> well, it's interesting, um, uh, as I was listening to Rabbi Baumel, it, uh, it occurred to me that um, the uniqueness of the meal that we're having, when we talk about Passover foods, as Rabbi, as Rabbi Baumel said, these foods are not ancillary. They're not just like, oh, it's this holiday, so our custom is to eat this type of food because that's the custom for the holiday, the way Americans will eat you know, turkey and, and uh, you know, and, and, and cranberry sauce on Thanksgiving, because that's how you celebrate. This isn't the celebration. Um, the, with the uniqueness of the foods that we're eating at the Seder, and here I'm not, I'm not just echoing what Rabbi Baumol said, but maybe taking it in a slightly different direction, is the actual ritual, the primary ritual of this holiday is not something done in the synagogue. It is the actual eating of these foods, meaning, let me put it this way. It says in scripture, in the book of Exodus, we are told that on the day of the Exodus from Egypt, we are to tell the story and eat specific foods. 
And the eating of those foods is actually the fulfillment of a commandment. It is service of God. It's worship. And that sounds a little strange to people. We're worshiping God by eating. Now, that only sounds strange to us because we are modern people who don't live in temple times. If, if we live in the time of the temple, in the temple, it was very common for there to be foods that were part of temple service, that were part of offerings that were brought, that would be consumed as part of worship. A great example of that is the Thanksgiving offering. Like in, in Psalm uh, uh, 116, where the psalmist says that I will bring a, a sacrifice, an offering of thanksgiving and call out the name of the Lord. That's not just celebrating something. That is actually a very specific ritual. When someone ha had a, was thanking God for a personal redemption, they were healed from an illness or they survived something, uh, something great happened to them in life and they want to thank God publicly, they would bring this offering to the temple. But this isn't an offering that would then get burnt on the altar. This is an offering that they would invite their friends and family and they would sit down and eat it and the eating itself, the consuming of this, of this food is itself a form of worship. Now, let me just explain how that works, because I think about this a lot at Passover that, you know, this isn't like, you know, we go to synagogue and we say whatever ritual prayers, whatever liturgy we have to say for the day and then come home. And now we're going to have our festive meal. That's not what this is. The meal itself is a ritual and including the eating, the quantities that we eat, the order in which we eat things. The specific things that are eaten are, some of them are mentioned directly in the Bible. Some of them came slightly <laughs> after in early rabbinic times and temple times, but we're doing, we're eating the exact same foods that were eaten in the temple uh, on this day. And that's the actual fulfillment. And again, so our relationship to food spiritually becomes different in that regard. We're worshiping God through this eating. And the way this makes sense to me is that eating is something that we enjoy. It gives us sustenance. Um, we're, we're literally taking in the fuel of our lives. And when we do that in the context of praising God, in the context of thanking God, what we're doing is we're actually elevating the entire experience. That this physical, like putting gas in the tank, so to speak, when I'm putting food in so I have sustenance so I can live, what I'm basically saying is that my life, my very physical life, is all about service of God. So here I'm actually, even my, my eating, it's actually a very profound type of worship uh, that, that I'm, I'm enjoying this. My enjoyment is an enjoyment of, of thanking and praising God. My, the sustenance that I'm getting from it is a sustenance that I'm getting in the context of serving and praising God. So it's, uh, I find it a very deep experience in that regard. Uh, and uh, I, I do like eating matzah. I know Rabbi Baumel said it's difficult to eat. It's definitely difficult to digest. I, I love matzah. I actually enjoy it. And I'm one of those strange people who eats matzah all year round. I have neighbors who, uh, when they have leftover matzah, a lot, of, a lot of people are sick of matzah by the end of Passover, by the end of the seven days. So I have neighbors who are, you know, they get sick of matzah. They all know that they could give me their leftover matzah because I'm going to eat it. I'm going to eat it all year. Well, that's all. Okay. So that's awesome. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, yeah. No. Let me ask, let me throw something out at you and see if, uh, if you agree, it's going to be a, a provocative statement. Um, on Pesach, the most significant aspect of the food regarding this holiday is that which we don't eat more than even the matzah, which we do eat. Agreed. So oh, that's something that is uh, unusual. I for agree people. with you absolutely. Right? We 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 know that eating matzah is very important, but oh, if you eat chametz, then um, you are in a whole lot of trouble. And the idea of the chametz seems to take center stage, which somewhat counterintuitive, right? We have we have general holiday where we eat things, and this means this, and this means that, and you know we get that, and comes along the Torah and says no no no. no. The things that you sh normally eat, the things which represent joy, which represent opulence, which represent uh, uh, um, you know, time and, and enjoyment, that you're prohibited in the most serious way. No bread, no bagels, no cakes, nothing that uh, is what is part of your normal daily routine. And I think that we are, you know, ask any person who's, who's preparing their house for Passover, 
And the, 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 the fear is what happens if I encounter, if I forgot about some chametz, what, what do we do then? And that's a real major concern. And our, at our Pesach table, we're gonna have a major discussion about why not eating the chametz is more important than eating the matzah. That's great. Do you want to respond, Rabbi Rabbi Luki, or, 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 or yeah? It, it, look, listen. It's uh, it, I, I'm not sure that I agree with the very last sentence that you said that it's more important than eating the matzah, because the eating of the matzah on the on the first day, meaning on that night, on the seder night, is a direct command in the Torah in the same way that there's a direct command not to have any chametz. So I don't know if I would rank them as one well, being more important punishment? than the other. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It definitely brings a it brings a, a severe punishment. Um, but uh, you know, the there's also another angle. There's another side to the not eating of chametz, and the uh, meaning not eating leaven and only eating matzah, which is actually a very simple explanation that uh, I don't hear too often. But but I say it to my to my children every year at the seder is that in the temple itself. In the temple itself, if you read through all of the offerings in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Numbers and wherever the, wherever the sacrifices, wherever the temple service is laid out in the Torah, read through you know, all those boring sections that have all the details of every offering and this much oil and this much wine and this much and this animal and what you do with the blood. And, and there's all the meal offerings and there are and, and meal offerings were made from flour. One of the rules in the book of Leviticus, right near the beginning of the whole sacrificial section of that book, is that it was forbidden to have any leaven in the temple. Meaning, the, you know, everyone knows about the showbreads, right? There was the table in the temple that had the showbreads on it. What most people do not know, you have to read the words carefully in the Bible, but in our, in our collective imagination, we picture these loaves of bread. Those were matzahs. There was no bread in the temple that was leavened, except one day a year, which was on the on the holiday of Shavuot, oh, Pentecost, which is an exception. But that's an exception. That's not our topic tonight. The point being that on Passover, what we're actually doing is we're behaving as though we're in the temple. Here I am. I'm not. I'm. It's like I'm in the temple. I'm eating. If it was temple times, I'm eating sacrificial meat. I am not eating any leaven in the temple. There's no leaven. Even in the Egyptian Passover, that only happened once where they put blood on their home. The only place that blood of a sacrifice is put at all in the Bible is on the altar in the temple. So it's almost as though the home became, has become a kind of miniature temple so that even though all year round I can eat leavened bread, but in the temple all year round, they're not eating leavened bread. So for one week out of the year, my home has the same rules as the temple does. Nice, nice. Um, I can see that we're in for a really uh, enriching conversation um, on, on the back and forth on just that one uh, question. Um, I know that there are questions, so please, please folks, do, uh, do write your questions in the chat. Um, I will just, add in my two cents and I'm not a rabbi so and I don't pretend to be one but I love matzah and I also happen to uh, as some of you may, may know there's a traditional food everyone has their own different way of making it called matzah brai typically eggs ma crumbled up matzah and water I, I have a my own book in the works a, a cookbook of gourmet matzah brai um, so, so Rabbi Balma, when you come home in your next store, we'll save you some matzahs. Um, but we've got about a hundred, uh, I think a hundred different recipes for matzah brai wow. that we're working on. And if anyone's following and doesn't know what matzah brai is and wants to know, please be in touch. Um, let's, let's move on to the next question. Again, most of our, uh, guests following this tonight are Christian. And so for many of them, they're not familiar with the Jewish, um, customs, but be, because Passover is one of the three biblical pilgrimage holidays and one of several other holidays, including the, more, including the modern ones, uh, um, Yom HaTzma'ud, Israeli Independence Day, and others that Christians are connecting and celebrating with. Um, uh, maybe we'll start with Rabbi Willicki this time. Um, why do you think that, that that is especially the case with Passover, 
that Christians are connecting and celebrating and, and, and interacting. And, and, and I know you're an Orthodox rabbi, but what would, what's from your perspective, having had these conversations a lot, the significance of Passover to Christians, if that's not inappropriate? No, it's very appropriate. And it's a, it's a good question. And, you know, in the space that you and I, Jonathan, work in, where, you know, we're part of organizations, Jewish organizations, uh, or Jewish and Christian organizations that are in this, in this relationship building space, uh, this topic comes up every year. Uh, and it's something that that's discussed. And I have a, a slightly different view than even most of the people who work in our line of work about Christians celebrating Passover. There are some Jews who are, who are uncomfortable by Christians celebrating Passover. Uh, and it's very, and, and the reason is that they feel it's almost like cultural appropriation uh, or that Christians are kind of, you know, taking Passover and doing something else with it. Uh, this is not my view. I'm just gonna lay out a common view and that I think it's important for Christians to be sensitive about. And that is that, um, when Christians do celebrate Passover, naturally, as Christians, and they're people of the Christian faith, what they do is they uh, see all kinds of symbolism in what they're doing on Passover that relates to Jesus. Uh, the crucifixion of Jesus happened around this time of year. The Last Supper scene, as detailed in the book of Matthew, is actually a Passover Seder. And therefore, there are certain things that are that are done and said in that in the Christian scriptures, and in Christian uh, in the Christian history that relate directly to Passover, um, and relate to some of the symbolism and and attribute Christian symbolism to some of the things that are going on on Passover. This type of uh, approach to Passover, I'm going to be very frank with you, for most Jews makes them very uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable because, you know, our Passover is Exodus chapter 12, 13, 14. You can read it there. You got all the rules of how Passover goes. It's about our exodus from Egypt um, and the commands that God gave us. In fact, I'll go even further. When it comes to Passover specifically, one of the rules that's stated in Exodus chapter 12, when the laws of the Passover sacrifice and the meal and the matzah and all that stuff is first told by God to Moses and Aaron, one of the rules of Passover is that someone who is not a member of the Jewish people is forbidden from participating. It's interesting because that, that rule does not exist with the other holidays. And I'm not saying this to say that you're not allowed to participate, not at all. Uh, that, that rule really relates to the actual eating of the meat of the offering. My point is that there's a, uh, the, th what the theme of Passover from a Jewish perspective is very particularistic. It's very much about the nation of Israel, the Jewish people becoming a people and entering into the beginnings of our covenant as a nation. That covenant, of course, uh, was expanded at Sinai seven weeks later. But that's, it's a very particularistic holiday, as opposed to, let's say, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a very universalistic holiday. The liturgy has universal themes, and the book of Zechariah talks about it being celebrated by all nations. That's not the case with Passover. So from an internal Jewish perspective, there's this discomfort with Christians celebrating Passover. That's not my approach at all. My attitude is actually the polar opposite. I believe uh, my personal feeling is that Christians should feel totally comfortable celebrating Passover as Christians, and it's not my place to tell Christians how to celebrate Passover and what symbolism to attribute to things and whether they're going to Christologize things or not, and it's not cultural appropriation for a very simple reason. This event has importance in Christian history. The Last Supper the, the meal that Jesus had with his with his disciples was a Passover seder, and there's there's a scene in the book of, in in the in the New Testament that can be read there. So if a Christian wants to connect with that event and wants to connect with the with the origins of Christianity that surround that Passover, who am I? Who am I to tell them, oh, don't celebrate Passover? That's cultural appropriation. So I have no problem whatsoever with Christians celebrating Passover. 
Uh, I think it's, you know, and, and it's, uh, and, and in, in general, I think that Christians connecting with biblical feasts, biblical holidays, based on the lunar biblical calendar that we follow is a net positive. I mean, that is the true calendar and that is God's seasons. And I think it's a positive thing for Christians to connect. However, at the same time, the Christians who are in a Zoom call like this or watching this, who are interested in having a positive and understanding relationship with Jews need to be sensitive to how Jews see this festival and not uh, uh, try to force the, the Christian symbolism and the Christian interpretations of these practices onto this holiday and to appreciate what this, what this festival means. What does the matzah mean? What does the wine mean? What does the Seder mean? What does the lamb mean? What does the blood mean? What do they mean not from a Christian perspective, but what do they mean for Jews? Does that mean that you have to drop all your, your Christian perspective in your, own, in your own observance of the day? Absolutely not. But if we're looking for that sensitivity and we're looking for that understanding, we have to appreciate that this festival has a very different meaning for Jews than it has for many Christians. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't, right. but for many Christians who market and celebrate it with a, through a, a, a Jesus lens. I hope great. this is a good answer. That's a great uh, answer. And, and uh, Rabbi Bauma, before you uh, continue, I just want to, uh, uh, or, or comment, um, I just want to interject. I believe our friend Bishop Uma from Tanzania is with us at the moment. I'm just kind of scrolling through to make sure he's there. He asked a great question earlier in the day. No, he's not at the moment, but if he comes back on, he might want to. He asked a great question, um, which, is, which is so intuitive from a Christian perspective. Um, what did he email me? What, what do we, we do, what do we Jews use instead of the body and the blood of Jesus at the Passover Seder as we Christians believe? Um, so I think you just I think you just addressed that really well. But if he comes back on, um, we'll see certainly see if he's got any additional uh, question on that. Um, Rabbi Balmel, you work often in a different uh, market, if you will, among Christians. What's your thought about Christians observing? You're plotting your experience about Christians observing and celebrating Passover. Um, I certainly grew up with that discomfort. Uh, I'll tell you right now, Rabbi Pesach, uh, and knowing that uh, regular traditional uh, Judaism, Jewish thought is that it is prohibited for uh, Christians to certainly uh, join my Passover table. Uh, so I kind of have that in the back of my mind. But in the last years, I've been exposed, and Jews generally, Orthodox Jews in particular, Aren't, aren't, aren't usually exposed to uh, other cultures and other religions and, uh, and don't really get a sense of the true desire of uh, people of other faiths and shared faiths to um, their curiosity and their interest. Um, I, as, as was said in the introduction, I've been the rabbi in, uh, in Krakow, Poland for the last seven years. And um, for me, it's been an eye-opening experience. I have some P uh, Polish students who are uh, who are big uh, uh, Passover uh, uh, celebrators uh, on this call, and I recall uh, um, around five years ago, I got a call from um, from an organization that asked me to join a, a mock Passover because they understood they couldn't have the rabbi on Passover. So a few days before Passover if I could go and, uh, and share with them some thoughts about Passover, kind of like what we're doing here, but in a hall with the Passover Seder, with the plate and, and, uh, and, every, and everything like that. It was from a place called Nova Sanch, which had a huge Jewish community before the war. And this group uh, invited me to come there. And I thought, okay, we'll sit there, 10 of us, we'll sit there, a few of us. And I got there, there were 150 Christians, Poles Christians. <laughs> who, including the priests and the bishop, and everyone was sitting there, and everyone was sitting there over the Seder plate. And in fact, they were all eating the Seder plate. And I had to like slow them down to say, wait a second, we don't just eat the Seder plate. We, we talk about the Seder plate um, before we go and dig into uh, to the, to the, 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 the meal. And I understood that I think that they were trying to connect. Now, Obviously, I didn't ask every single one of them, you know, what are you doing this for? What does this mean to you? 
are you trying to get to the root of Passover? After all, Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was celebrating Passover, probably like Jews was, have been celebrating Passover, right? The, the interpretation that he gave kind of took on a new uh, meaning for Christians. But perhaps that's one approach that you're taking, that you're trying to figure out what the original um, source is, right? If the, if the wine isn't, you know, the blood of Christ, then what is the wine? And then you'd have to say, okay, well, you know, before Jesus, what did wine represent in the Bible? And what, you know, why in, in Psalms 104, do they talk about it, wine being gladdening the heart and, and bread uh, giving sustenance and, and what those meant to, a, you know, ancient Near Eastern uh, Jews and, and, uh, and people at the time. But I also feel that Christian Poles who are sensitive to be living in Poland, where there used to be 3 million Jews and now there are 3,000 Jews or 5,000 or whatever the number might be, I think that part of their desire to celebrate Passover, to learn about Passover, to learn from a rabbi is to reconnect with the Poland of the past, with reconnecting that part of Poland was also a Jewish community and a Jewish life. And <clears throat> part of Christianity was also that it, it started from a, a Jewish source. So for me, um, I found that inspiring that uh, they, they were there to respect the Judaism that was part of their Polish heritage and they wanted to learn more about it. And uh, it behooved me then and it does now to continue on this mission to try to uh, uh, enlighten and to you know talk about what's happening uh, at the Pesach Seder. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, it, it's also interesting and a good segue kind of to my next question. Uh, I wasn't thinking about it so much from the perspective of Poland and the and the Holocaust, um, but next week, for instance, uh, one of our one of the top four programs that we're doing this global Passover prayer for Israel is going to be with a panel of four former Soviet Jewish refuseniks, which we can argue uh, as to how close that it was to the uh, enslavement of the Jewish people as in, uh, as in Egypt or, or, or the liberation of the Soviet Jews. We're gonna speak about that experience. Um, you certainly bring in a, um, a, a foot in, in a more distant past, but still in our, in our, in our um, uh, uh, in, in our in our immediate awareness, it's not ancient history for us in terms of the Holocaust of slavery. But one of the interesting things about how we do Passover is that we're to tell the story as if we were slaves, and I always find that challenging because uh, I don't know what that means. We and, and maybe because we're in a video, I, I don't have a video. I don't know what it looks like. We're also doing. We're by the way, we're also doing a program next week with Bishop Glenn Plummer to talk about the common. The similarities between the African American enslavement experience and liberation, and and ours, and and we have much more common material, much more current material uh, about the about the slavery experience. But in terms of the in terms of how we're sitting at our Passover table Saturday night, and we're telling the story, and we have to put ourselves somehow in the mindset of having been, of not having been slaves, being slaves. How do you do that? Uh, rabbis, I think Rabbi Wilkie, it's your turn. How do we do that? Well, I think one way is connecting with current events. Um, and, you know, one of the lines that we say in the Seder is that in every generation, there are those who rise up against the people of Israel and the Holy One, blessed is he, God saves us from their hands. It happens all the time. And we need to connect the Passover Seder to what we are currently living. I think that's a very important part of it. The Passover Seder is not meant to be only a discussion of a historical event that happened a long time ago, as you said. We emphasize it right from the beginning and throughout it that we're talking about ourselves. And in fact, once we get to the second half of the Seder, after the meal, um, let me just explain the structure briefly for anyone who might not know so we understand what I'm talking about. 
when the Seder begins, we start with a cup of wine, you know, uh, you know, where we sanctify the day, which is what we do on every Sabbath and on every festival. And then we start in with the text and the rituals that relate to the Seder, but we're not eating yet. We're telling the story of the Exodus from Egypt, and we're talking about the importance of telling the story, and we're praising God for what he did in Egypt. And then we get to the part where we do the ritual eating of the matzah and the bitter herbs and the meal. But then after that meal, the liturgy continues, the text continues. But the text after the meal, from then to the end of the Seder, doesn't mention the Exodus again. The Exodus is not, it, it's, it's not, it's literally not even mentioned, except there's a psalm that we say. And in that psalm, there happens to be a, a couple of lines that are about the Exodus, but there's other lines that are about other things. The Exodus is not what we're talking about. After the meal ends, we're talking about the future redemption. We're talking about the exile that we're currently in. We're talking about I, we end the Seder by, by singing and, and calling out next year in Jerusalem. The focus of the second half of the Seder is the future. So really what you have in the Seder is, is that, you know, every one of us lives our lives. Look, I was born in a certain year and I'm going to die in a certain year and I live my life. I, I lived part of it in the 20th century and part of it in the 21st century. And that's, that's my life. On the other hand, if we expand our, our scope and say, wait a second, I'm, I'm a link in a chain of history. I, the story of my life began thousands of years before I was born and it's gonna end long after I die. And that's my story. And therefore we start the Seder by talking about the history. We then actually eat and engage and we're, it's very much present tense. We are celebrating as though this happened to us. And then we talk about the future. And, you know, that is, you know, to me, that's a way to, you know, to bring it into our, our lives, to think about it, but also to talk about it. And I, I try to do this during the meal because that's like where it's about us is to talk about the current threats. <laughs> what are, who are the current, mm. you know, there's always, it, it's an interesting thing being a Jew. There's always some group of people in the world who are, declaring that they want to destroy the Jewish people. You know, today it's Iran and, and, uh, and maybe some others, some other, uh, you know, supporting actors uh, at, at various points. And then there was the Soviet Union that was trying to destroy Judaism. And, 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 and then you have, and you have Hitler. And in every generation, there's someone who's trying to destroy us. And we're told in the text that was written thousands of years ago to relate this experience to our current experiences. So really the Exodus from Egypt is the story, but the Exodus from Egypt is also being used as a metaphor for whatever is going on in our own lives. That's great. I think, I think it's a, a very nice analysis, but I, it, I don't think it answers the question and for a good reason. Um, it, 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 it's hard to answer that question. It's hard to answer that question. How do I tell my children what a, a slave is like? What, what does it mean? So we try to figure out, okay, slave is also anti-Semitism. There's a whole bunch of ways that we can skirt the issue of saying, what does it mean to be a slave? You know, the Talmud 1500 years ago says the following law. Um, if your parent dies, you have to tear your shirt. It's as if your heart is torn. So you have to tear your shirt in half, rip it. And then the Talmud asks a question that in modern days, we just don't understand the question. The question is, what if you only have one shirt? And then the Talmud gives an answer. Okay, you can sew it up somehow. And for us, for me and my kids, my kids have 82 shirts and 42 pants and, and seven pairs of shoes and a phone and a this and a that. And they just have no idea. And I have no idea. You know, what does it mean to not have? And part of slavery, one, ha one part of slavery is not having, and the other part of saving slavery is not being able to control even what I do have. And those two aspects are very, very, very difficult to try to get that in the mindset of, of not being, you know, being able to control your, your, yourself and your, and your, your, your fate. Um, I try to teach them, and I've actually been printing out uh, stories of, uh, of slave narratives 
to try to to get them to you know to get my 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 kids to understand what the experience is like you don't belong your time is not yours you have one shirt you uh, you can't make your own decisions it's a very very difficult thing to do and perhaps the rabbis were saying well at the very least eat the maror you know at the very least make sure that you taste something so bitter so uncomfortable and you think back well here is a you know one thousandths of an experience of what it might have been to at least eat like a slave for those who who don't know the hebrew word maror is the bitter herb that we eat during the during the seder so i i'm trying to teach my my family that that notion of 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 kind of having a, an experience outside of what we're normally used to and seeing things from another perspective short of you know bringing a slave or person who was a slave unfortunately nowadays it's possible right um uh, short of bringing someone to talk about that at my seder um it's a really really difficult thing to do okay thank you that's something that we need to contemplate because it's difficult and 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 yet it's still uh something that's uh, an obligation for us um talking talking uh about your seder uh, i want to on a i'm, I'm hosting and, and moderating between the two of you. We've got a fabulous group of people watching. And again, friends, continue. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to post them. Um, but let's, let's pretend for a minute that this is a TV reality show and I'm having you host guests who are not Jewish at your Seder. What are the three things that you have to, that you have to instruct, that you have to have them take out of the Passover Seder experience that would be taking place at your at your home Saturday night if this were if we had cameras there from all the different angles and we were broadcasting it well, maybe live Rabbi Balmo I think we're going to come back to you the most important thing that uh, I want some you know alien who's sitting at my Seder to to experience is um is the wow uh, there's so much going on and everyone is animated and everyone is involved. And I want them to say, why is Rabbi Baumel and his whole family dressed up in some kind of weird costume? And why are they getting up in the middle of the Seder and they're walking around and acting like they're, they're slaves? And, and why are uh, all of a sudden they're, you know, they're, 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 they're erupting in song when, uh, when you know, we didn't expect that? Um, and how is Rabbi, why is Rabbi Bamel asking and pointing to each person around the table to be involved and to interact and to bring their own um, part of the Seder and part of their experience with, uh, with them? Uh, I sent out already a week ago a, um, a letter to everyone at the Seder. And I said, you know, there's an obligation to see, to apply the message of, uh, of the Passover experience, like Rabbi Pesach said to uh, our day and age. And the way that uh, we're gonna do it is, we're gonna say that everyone has a Passover Seder story to tell. Now, your story might not be, you know, from slavery to redemption in the finite physical sense of the word, but perhaps in a more uh, metaphysical way, you know, maybe psychologically you went through something that was a, was a, stri a, a strife and a, tri a struggle, and you have your own journey. And I want, I want everyone to talk about their journey because their journey is part of the ancient journey of the, of the people of Israel. So there's a lot of eating and a lot of drinking and a lot of uh, uh, dancing and a lot of everything going on in order to keep everyone as involved as possible on this night for us. Great. Rabbi Wilicki, your table. The, the cameras are on. You've got guests or aliens or the aliens who are guests. Well, if I, yeah, exactly. If I have guests at my table who, who were not Jewish, they'd probably be Christian considering that uh, a lot of my friends are Christian. Um, the, you say three things. The number one thing that I would want them to gain from this is an appreciation for the Jewish historical consciousness. Let me explain what I mean. Um, 
in in our work in Jewish Christian relations, you know, the work that we do when we encounter people, one of the first things that I learned when I started getting involved in Jewish Christian relations was that I started reflecting on my own Jewish identity, being around, you know, I'd spent so much of my life only among Jews and you start to think about your own identity more. I'm sure, Jonathan, you have that same experience. Um, and the one of the things that I noticed first is that Jews have a different relationship to history than, than non-Jews. We, we, we just do. Uh, and sometimes it can be, uh, it, sometimes it can cause a negative uh, uh, impact. Mostly, I think it's a net positive. I'll give you an example of the negative. Um, when I when I talk to Jews about the fact that I'm involved in Jewish Christian relations, one of the common reactions, negative reactions that Jews will have, what that they'll be resistant to Jewish Christian relations, has to do with the fact that there are, you know, there's a history of Christian anti-Semitism. Now they'll literally say things like, think of what they did to us in the Crusades. Think of what the Christians did to us in the Spanish Inquisition. Now, these are things that happened between 500 and 1,000 years ago. Um, and, or even more recent things, you're a, a Christian living today, when I say that to Christians, that that's how Jews uh, think a lot of the time, very often the Christians will just think that that's a little bit odd. Because for a Christian living today, they don't identify with those past events. They don't see themselves as the extension of those Christians who persecuted Jews 500 years ago or 200 years ago or a thousand years. Or that we see that. Or that we see that, right, exactly. They don't, they don't think in that historical way. And there's, I, as I reflect on this, as I, when I, again, when I first got involved in Jewish Christian relations, I thought about this a lot. The Jewish historical consciousness is very strong. Jews take history very, very seriously. In fact, most Jews, I think, don't even realize how seriously we take history compared to everyone else. Meaning for in a Jewish uh, consciousness, something that happened 200 years ago is very recent. 500 to 1,000 years ago is a kind of mid-range. For something to be really, you know, something that, that happened a long time ago, that's like 2,000 years ago. I mean, that's kind of like, that's really the Jewish consciousness. I'll put it another way. When we're sitting in the synagogue on the holiday of Purim, reading the book of Esther, and it gets to the point in the story where we win the, where the Jews win the war, it is very tangibly, at an emotional level, a sense we won. We. We really very much feel this is us. This is what happened to us. The sense of collective identity that we have as Jews is not just a collective identity in the present tense. It's not even primarily in the present tense. It's very historical. If you, if you open up a Jewish prayer book and just read the daily liturgy, there's a lot of history in it. We, we talk about history a lot. We relate to history a lot. Our identities are very bound up in history. Some of that is enhanced by the fact that we're literally saying the same words daily that have been said by Jews for thousands of years. And that historical consciousness is on its, is, is on gr its greatest display is the Passover Seder. There's very much this, as I said before, kind of like a widening of the lens. Our, the Jewish identity, I think there's no greater expression of Jewish identity than the Passover Seder. So what I would want my guests to get a, a, a sensitivity to is how intensely Jews relate to Jewish history as a personal, very personal matter. Um, the other thing I'd like them to get from it is, uh, and this might be a little controversial to some people listening, is the value under certain circumstances of drinking four cups of wine. You know, because most of our uh, most of the Christians I know don't drink. It's kind of a taboo, and I understand where that's coming from. And I certainly don't advocate just you know, kind of casual drinking all the time. But there's context. Context is everything when it comes to when it comes to drinking wine. Uh, I'll put it this way: Let's say someone's depressed because I don't know, like their girlfriend broke up with them or they lost their job, and they start drinking. So what's going to happen as they drink? 
they're just going to get even more depressed, right? They're going to start crying and sobbing and talking about how their life is over, right? Let's say someone's happy because, you know, I don't know, they got a promotion or their or their their favorite sports team won a championship and they start drinking. What's going to happen as they drink? They're going to get even more happy. By the, by the end of the night, they're going to be hugging people and, and screaming for joy. In other words, what alcohol does is it turns up the volume on whatever it is we're feeling. And there's a rabbinic expression that when wine comes in, the secret or the truth comes out. When wine goes in, the truth comes out. And in other words, we, we drop all of our masks and we drop all of our externals and we emphasize what it is that we're feeling, whatever, whatever it is that we're experiencing. So now it's a dangerous thing. It's playing with fire. I understand the aversion to alcohol and seeing it as an evil. It causes lots of evil in the world. But if the context is set up and the framework is set up, that the, the, what is going on is a celebration of God's redemption of the people of Israel throughout history. And we're honestly experiencing that and telling that story. And while we're doing it, we're progressively ingesting more and more wine as the night goes on. We're slowly, well, not so slowly sometimes, turning up the volume on that whole relationship to God's redemption. And it actually has some value in in the right context. Okay. I'll leave it there. All right. So well, we're gonna have a just we're gonna have a sign up list for those <clears throat> who want to go have wine at Rabbi Willicky Seder. Having having just purchased my two big bottles of grape juice from my Seder, I'm gonna have to <laughs> just dissent from your I actually uh, never I only drink wine at the Passover Seder, by the way. I only drink wine at the Passover Seder. I don't even I'm drink it. I'm not a drinker wine. and I don't get it and it doesn't <laughs> excite me and I do my best to stay away from it and every possibility. So for those who can, and for those who, who uh, you know, it, it does something for them, I hear it, but it's not working for me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, mo moving on, I, I, I have a couple more questions, but I'm anxious for some of you who are going to try and sneak your questions in. Um, anyone who has questions, feel free to use the chat. We're going to do a Q&A in a few moments. Um, I, I think, uh, Rabbi Balma, you were speaking before about specifically engaging your children. Um, and I think between the three of us, including children-in-law and soon-to-be children-in-law, we probably have about 20 of them. So we're veterans in raising children and having seders with, uh, with our children. Um, and, and the Passover Seder is uniquely, in many ways, focused on children. So I wanted to ask from your perspectives, both as, as fathers and rabbis and teachers, why is that important? And what have you done successfully in your parenthood or, 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 or rabbihood that has really engaged and enhanced your children's experience? Um, I forgot where we start. Rabbi Balma, you're in front of me right now nodding, so go. Um, it, it seems from you study the text that the most fundamental aspect of the Passover Seder <clears throat> is to relate to your children. In fact, the Torah says, the Bible talks about teaching your children, telling the story to your children. Your child is the subject. It's not, you know, usually children are meant to be seen and not heard or not even seen and not heard. And, um, you know, I'm busy. I'm talking about important things. Um, wait till you get older, and comes along the Pesach Seder, and it flips it on its head. It says, Keneged arba banim dibra Torah. The Torah spoke about four different types of children towards which you should be telling your story. In other words, you're telling your Pesach story to your kids. It's a transmission to the next generation. And therefore, every single father and mother at the Pesach Seder has to become an educator and has to learn how to best uh, in, enlighten, inspire, keep your kids awake, do what you can to make sure that they get excited about this because it's a seminal moment in, during the year. The, the Torah tells us that, that um, the rabbis say that the Torah speaks to four different types of children. It's a famous passage that says, one is wise, one is wicked, one is simple, and one can't even ask a question. And I think the rabbis were, you know, learning the different uh, verses in such a way as to tell us 
that you might encounter, you might have four children with four completely different styles of cognition. You might have four different children with, with four different uh, t- sets of challenges. And if you're not ready to engage in each one on their own level, then you're, uh, you're gonna you know, fail at, at reaching them all. And your job, your most important job is to be a parent to your children and raise them to be inspired to go out and become the best that they can be. So you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have a fascinating group of uh, a wicked person and a wise person, a wicked person, which is strange. You would expect that there would be, if you said one child is wise and one child is dumb. Nope, there's no such thing as a dumb child. There is such a thing as a wicked child or a child that is thinking in wicked ways or thinking in ways that are, that are against the grain or doesn't want to have anything to do with it or is rejecting it all. How do you deal with that child? That's a question that the Talmud wants you to focus on. And at the same time, another child is, is filled with uh, wisdom and filled with excitement and filled with um, wanting to learn more and wanting to know more. And the rabbis teach us that you have to, based on a verse, Chanoch l'nar al bidarko, you have to teach each one of your children according to their capabilities, according to their level of cognition and, and, and development. And I think that this is the most important thing to do at the Seder table. I was at my rabbi Seder 20 years ago, 30 years ago, oh my, and his, his children, he was a great rabbi, and his children were all great rabbis already. No one was young. There was no one five years old. They were all in their 20s and 30s, leaders and rabbis uh, in their communities. And he was still asking each one of them questions as if it was, you know, my young children, or the, but the questions more, more intense and more uh, intellectual. He saw it as his obligation to in- engage these children. And that's what we have to do the same way. Beautiful. Thank you. Rabbi Wilhi, your, your Passover parenting experiences? Well, I have eight kids, so it gets busy. I mean, the way <laughs> I usually do it, I mean, now my kids are a little bit older, so uh, um, it's a little bit different, and uh, I don't yet have grandchildren. Uh, but generally, I would have them each prepare a section of the Seder to talk about. I would have them prepared in advance. Um, so that at each, that way they they each studied a section of the seder, and each year I'd give give out different sections, and then at the seder they would lead the discussion for that section. Um, that's a way of so my role in teaching them would be by assigning them a section and having them prepare something, and that way their people tend to remember things better when they do some work like that. But just the whole importance of children, I think it it, it cannot be understated that. In the right there at the very beginning in Exodus 13, when we're when the commandment to do this is first mentioned, right there in Exodus 13, uh, verses six, seven, and eight, when it's laying out, don't eat any un, uh, don't eat any leavened bread, eat only unleavened bread, and then in verse eight, right there, uh, this is ex- again Exodus 13, verse eight. On that day, tell your child. I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And this is, you know, the fact that it's right there, meaning we have to think of it in a, as a command from God right here, the same way God's commanding us to eat the matzah, the same way God is commanding us to, you know, in temple times, bring the Passover lamb offering in the same way that God is, is commanding us everything else that he commands us in the Bible. He's commanding us to tell this particular story to our children. And, you know, this relates back to what I said before about historical consciousness. So I'm very, uh, I, I, I speak to my children at the Seder a lot about the importance of historical consciousness, of seeing our lives in a historical context. But it's also, it, it's, it, it's worth thinking about for anyone who, who wants to live biblically, to think biblically, that this is a command from God to tell this story to our children. That's a good point. Thank you. That's great. Um, I, w- I, I, I want to pause on my own interaction with you both. It's been really, I, I hope that you all agree who watching this has been really uh, 
engaging and, 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 and quite delightful. Um, and, and give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, you can use the chat for those of you who are on uh, Zoom with us. Uh, actually, maybe I'll just change the view so we can see all of you. Um, I, I you know, certainly welcome conver uh, conversation now. Uh, it may be easier to get a couple of questions at once so the rabbis can address them. But on behalf of our friend and uh, board member, Dr. Dave Pitcher in Arizona, he asked a question if one of you could explain um, the significance of breaking and hiding and then eating the middle matzah. Should I go first? Go ahead. Okay, so uh, this is an interesting ritual. Uh, at, let me just first explain what it is. At the beginning of the Seder begins, we have three matzahs on the table um, and we take one of the matzahs and we break it in half. It's one of the first things we do in the Seder. We break it in half and wrap up the larger half of it and essentially put it away. Now, uh, it's going to be eaten later on at the end of after the meal, much later in the Seder, uh, in the, uh, but why do we do that? So that's the question. Now, uh, there's, there's no 100% clear, like this is the reason why we do it answer that's given. Um, the standard answer is that, well, the answer that's given in the Talmud, which requires some explanation. So there is an answer given, but it's not so clear. The answer is that it's like a poor person. When a poor person who doesn't know where their next meal is coming from gets a hold of a, of a nice big you know, loaf of bread, they don't eat the whole thing in that meal because they don't know where the next meal is coming from. So they eat some of it and they put some of it away for another day. So since at the beginning of the Seder, think about what I said about, about the historical story that we're telling. We start off talking about the slavery and we start off, you know, dipping herbs in salt water to recall the tears of the slavery. And then as we get deeper into the night, we start celebrating the redemption. So at that early part of the Seder, where we're trying to relate to the slavery and being poor and, and, and not being in control of our own destiny, we act like poor people, where we're breaking the matzah and putting away the larger piece for later because we're poor. And that's what poor people do, which, of course, begs the question. If we're putting it away like a poor person to eat on another day at a different meal, we should be eating it the next day. We eat it the same night, but I kind of have already answered the question. We eat it at the after the meal where we're already, we're redeemed. We're not the poor person anymore. Now we're free. Now we know where our next meal is coming from. So the very same piece that initially we put away because we were because we were in dire straits, as the night goes on and we experience redemption, we feel comfortable pulling it back out and saying, you know what? I'm now a free man. I, I, don't, need to, I don't need to be worried about where my next meal is coming from anymore. And we eat that, we eat that. Uh, there's a, there, there are certainly other interpretations. What I'm telling you nice. is not a universally held interpretation. Dr. Pitcher says that was interesting. Rabbi Bauma, what do you have to add? Oh, not much. I, I think it's along the same lines. Uh, I, I like the idea of uh, breaking our matzah, um, breaking, breaking things down, um, recognizing that when we normally begin our meals, there's a sense of whole, there's a sense of completeness. And um, when we think about the matzah, we have to take it and we have to break it. Now, the matzah has, as I mentioned earlier, um, two seemingly diametrically opposing um, expressions. On the one hand, it's called bread of redemption. It's the bread that symbolizes the, 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 the exodus from Egypt. That's the matzah. On the other hand, we're talking about poor man's bread. It's so interesting that we take the bread that is, you know, the least, it, it is the, the, um, the simplest bread, right? The simplest chemical, it's flour and water with no other additives. So it's not complex, but its message is very complex. So you take something very simple like the matzah and then you add the dimensions and layers and layers and layers so that 
you become like, uh, you know, like the experience of the matzah that you're, you're celebrating freedom, but also a bit rushed, but also you feel like you're still at the beginning of your journey, but also you realize that this is representing finally re being released from, from slavery. Try to figure all of that up at once. And one of the ways to do it is by breaking that matzah and saying, okay, it's not the whole, you know, it's not a whole system of piece, it's a broken piece. And what do I do with that broken piece? Well, I try to fit, put it together. And that's what we do during the Seder. Very nice. Thank you. Um, barring any other questions, I just want to give a last call for that. Uh, first, and, and, and let people chime in as I'm just kind of speaking now for a moment. Uh, this, is a, this is, as I said at the outset, if anyone didn't remember or join late, this is the first of four programs of the Global Passover Prayer for Israel. And each of them will be discussing Passover in a different way and different perspective, but I invite you, of course, to register and join us for all the other sessions, but keep this as an ongoing dialogue. If you have questions, I uh, don't want to make a 100% commitment for either of the rabbis, but if there are questions that come up to you afterward, feel free to text and I'll see if we can get uh, get some answers for you, because it should be engaging and, and, and ongoing. Um, so I want to right now, before we wrap up with just the announcements about what's coming next week, invite a, a, a good friend who's uh, with us in Helsinki, Finland, Dr. Susanna Kokonen, um, who's also, we're very blessed to have her on board um, as one of the advisory board members of Genesis 123 Foundation to join us. Please unmute yourself so we can hear you and close us out in prayer before we do the announcements. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this program. I want to thank you both, uh, Rabbi Pesach and Avi. And um, I just want to make one very short comment. I know it's very irritating when somebody's asked to pray and then they want to speak. I'm not going to do that. I just want to say that in terms of what we were talking about, about the past and this being um, Old Testament history that seems like distant to us. And I was just thinking that what is happening in our day and time, actually the most persecuted people right now are Christians. And there's a report that just came out that over 300 million Christians are being persecuted around the world. And we don't seem to be able to care for, you know, for our own uh, brethren. And I feel like anti-Semitism is rising very much in the Western world at the same time. So I feel very strongly that this is not by chance, that we, we share the Bible and we share much, much of that biblical background. But somehow at this point of history, we are also sharing this hatred that is targeting both of us. And I think that's kind of maybe making the story of um, what happened in that first Passover and what happened in Egypt, making it more alive to us in 2020. And now I will pray. So Lord God, we just come to you and we are separated by oceans, but we are connected um, by this technology. And Lord God, I feel like this um, festival of freedom, that it's so hard this year because our world is not free. Um, so many people are suffering from COVID-19 and from all the related restrictions and lockdowns and people are feeling very lonely and some people are feeling very desperate. And I just, as we approach this, um, this festival of freedom, Lord God, I just ask it for your mercy for our world, because our world today, we need your mercy, even just in order to be able to um, live through this time. And, and Lord, we know that there have been much harder times that people have to live through, but I want to I want to pray for each individual who feels that this is difficult for them. And I want to pray for each um, nation. And then, Lord God, I want to pray for us as Jews and Christians to be able to come together and to be able to understand that how much we share, but how much more we need to stand with each other at these days that we are living in now. And I thank you, Lord God, that you gave us your word and you have given us um, an understanding 
of what happened in history. And Lord God, how we need to relate to it today through your word. And I thank you for each person who was here tonight. And I, I, Lord God, I pray for Jonathan and for everybody who was here for a special blessing because of this time that we had together. Thank you, Lord, that you hear this prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. It's a, wonderful to have you with us. I think we have four, four continents tonight. And just as we wrap up, um, some announcements for next week. Uh, the Haggadah has been mentioned a number of times today. Um, I actually meant to have organized better to ha give the opportunity. I'm working with a, um, one of the big uh, bookstores here in Jerusalem to have some Haggadot, the plural of Haggadahs available to any of our Christian friends who uh, would like to have that experience. They won't arrive until after the holiday, uh, but we're going to try and find some that are appropriate and, and culturally fitting with language that, that'll be easier to follow. So you can be in touch with me on that. Um, we have, as I mentioned at the outset and a few moments ago, three incredible events. Um, I, uh, you, can, you can email or contact me directly for information for the Zoom link. Those following on Facebook, you can continue to follow the Genesis 123 Foundation on Facebook or on YouTube. But in short, on Monday, we have Monday the 29th next week. We uh, we're doing a great program with um, with uh, Bishop Glenn Plummer from the Church of God in Christ here in in Israel um, on the shared experience of uh, African Americans and Jews and how that's related in terms of slavery and redemption. On the 31st, we are going to be doing a program with four former Soviet Jewish. Refuseniks, Jews who, uh, who grew up in the Soviet Union and in their own uh, struggles um, fought to get out of the Soviet Union. For those of you who don't know that history and the oppression of Jews in the Soviet Union for, for um, uh, generations there, it's something you're going to want to be part of because in, in a sense it's been very much our modern exodus story. And uh, the, for, the fourth and final of the webinars next week will be, um, will be with four Christian friends who also in their ways celebrate uh, Passover, do their own seders. And we're gonna have a conversation, perhaps a little from the flip side of the one we just had today about why that is indeed significant and, and how that enhances them as Christians and, uh, and, and their understanding and connection with the Jewish people. Finally, folks, um, all of this is done. Everything we do is for free and everything that we do is uh, supported by generous donors. If it moves you to join us today, as many of you I know who, who already are uh, donors, if you care to make a donation, um, that helps. I think Rabbi Willicke used the, the analogy with the food. It keeps um, fuel in the tank for us to, uh, to be able to continue to do what we do. And, and you can go to genesis123.co to make a donation or just to find out more information. And I will close by wishing everyone a happy and joyous Pesach, a Chag Kasher Vesameach to all of you. Rabbi Baumel, did you want to say that in Polish? Wszystkiego uh, najlepszego. Sounds good to me. Friends, thank you. Rabbi Baumel, Rabbi Willicke, thank you for, uh, for joining yeah, us today man. and thank everyone you. for following us. God bless you. Happy, uh, happy and healthy. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Rabbi Pesach. Beautiful.